it is actually it is actually exciting follow up to the patient it is is good for the patient educate you know put it like all right so we come to qualitative information on the basis of oct features in textbooks they have given this qualification of macular edema spongy thickening cystoid form subfoveal fluid hyaloid traction and traction rd these two are surgical pathologies out of these three lalit based on oct appearance does your therapeutic approach alter and also your visual outcome you see there have been studies spongy edema i think responds best to antivegf there is no doubt but in other two forms so like cystoid and subfoveal also the first line will be antivegf a lot of these patients will respond but uh, if not then i will agree with shobit i may add the steroid to these so conditions. in general you don't give much or very focused importance to these pictures correct okay now this term i have been studying since my postgraduate days taught posterior hyaloid and they say that this is a hyaloid attachment to macula with partial pvd with subfoveal fluid tangential not anterior posterior attraction thicker and hyper reflective posterior hyaloid and ffs shows a diffuse deep intraretinal leakage now these are five representative pictures of various vitreo macular morbidity or vitreo macular pathologies in case of diabetic macular edema all of them have same implication in terms of disturbance to vision and structure all have the same kind of treatment that we can offer to them my question to professor tiwari is that is this term taught posterior hyaloid any different than vitreo macular attraction and why should you we not drop the term to reduce the confusion well i think basically if you see there are different spectrums of the same thing now you may call it by you may call it by any name but they are the different spectrums of the same thing and i personally feel all these things should be clubbed into one group vitreo macular attraction yes. syndrome thank you sir thank you for for agreeing me for uh, agreeing with me for a change <laughs> for a long time on this particular issue for years now let's come to vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema macular traction edema traction rd tot posterior hyaloid and erm are definite indications in addition to that literature describes refractory dme with attached hyaloid refractory dme with pvd microaneurysms close to fovea and enlarged foveal vascular zone and cystoid edema which is not resolving by any treatment as indications for vitrectomy do you perform vitrectomy in any of these situations shobit uh, i would uh, no i would not perform vitrectomy in present era in any of these i have in the past so but not the, received any results it is it is the vitreo retinal interface morbidity which is the indication and not the intra retinal abnormalities to put it summary yes, yes. now lalit uh, what percentage of your cases in this group benefit visually and anatomically very less sir very less and uh, maybe maybe less than 10% and pre operatively how do you comment on visual prognosis to these patients like you have a patient with traction edema and how do you tell him that how much you are going to benefit very difficult because frankly speaking it's such a difficult situation you can't uh, actually judge whether this patient will improve or not therefore i am very hesitant to operate also most of these patients added to this when we are doing a vitrectomy there could be ischemia there could be subfoveal exudates there could be rp metaplasia and damage due to laser when we do vitrectomy we combine it with pvd sometimes with phaco we do intraoperative laser we inject anti vegf triamcinolone some people remove ilm also now with all this gamut is it uh, right or scientific lalit to make an accurate statement on effect of vitrectomy on macular edema not getting the question is it accurate to can we make an absolute statement on exclusive effect of vitrectomy because we are no, combined yeah, no no Com because we are attacking with all the bombs yeah, actually so, everything has been so this Nothing is actually is not very well founded what effect vitrectomy will have on macular edema so i think uh, carry your message here is that you have done an i uh, scattered removal also you have done whole lot of things you know so what has really produced if at all an increase in vision is very difficult to say however we do give credit to vitrectomy but it may not be necessary for that right now literature says that time duration for complete macular thinning following vitrectomy can extend up to 12 months and in drcr it was 3 months 
This is cases, these are cases under our personal follow-up. This is picture on fourth post-operative day. This is picture on second day, this is fourth day, this is sixth day. This is picture before surgery, it is at three weeks. And this is picture at 40 days. To my experience, it is generally within 15 days time that maximal thinning occurs of macula. What is your uh, experience, Shobit? I would say four weeks is the optimum time after that you have achieved. Yes, my opinion might be a little biased though, because at conclusion of vitrectomy in these cases, I do tend to use drug adjuvant. Tend to use? I, either a steroid implant that, or that, anti -implant. that everybody is doing but despite that in my opinion it is 15 days maximal thickening and after that there is no recovery okay now we come to a very interesting thing tractional macular edema will of course be refractory to routine uh, medical treatment of diabetic macular edema that's not my concern my concern is lot many courses going on recalcitrant refractory or resistant diabetic macular edema wherein vitrectomy is being talked about like you have a set definition for CSME that this is how you define CSME. Do we have a set definition for non-tractional refractory diabetic macular edema? They say whatever does not respond to maximum treatment. Then what is maximum treatment by way of laser, intravitreal drugs, systemic control? Your judgment is OCT based or clinical judgment or it is FFA or visual equity, Dr. Lalit. I don't think so there is any consensus on this. You see, a lot of people will say three injections, but what is maximally agreed upon is six injections at the maximum. In a year. In a year, not so more than this. So if you give six injections, it does not respond, you call it refractory. Alok. So it's difficult, there's no consensus. We, what we usually do, we get a systemic... Close to mic, sir. We get the systemic control done, uh, give three injections of Avestin followed by lasers. Systemic we control, how long? Six weeks. Usually, it to start. In six weeks, things. nothing controls allo. With, to, with six to, weeks to adequately good, to adequately followed control by, followed to, by. to adequately control the pen metabolic disorder of diabetes yeah, mellitus take, but takes you at least six months. I agree, but usually to start a treatment, we give a six weeks of systemic control before we uh, we get. All right, you done. are not definite about it, Shobit. I would say there is no. There is no set definition, but I have attended an advisory board with Lalit and Professor Tiwari and a consensus was reached that before defining if a patient is well controlled, we give three injections, we don't see any in three months, we don't see any improvement All right. in visual so activity or… this faculty says that three injections maximum, call it refractory and Lalit says that six injections maximum and call it refractory. Now, there are reports that ILM peeling helps diabetic macular edema, which I don't believe. Like any, any experience with ILM peeling in diabetic macular edema along with vitrectomy? No, like sir. So, we should remember ILM is a part of retina. And frankly speaking, it's difficult. It's not similar to macular surgery. So, ILM peeling is fragments may come out. But frank, I do not insist on ILM peeling in diabetic macular edema. To your observation, it does not help. Okay, so we summarize that quality, qualitative information from OCT is useful in deciding treatment options. Quantitative information is helpful to patients and follow-up. Taught posterior hyaloid is a debatable term. Anatomic benefit is more than visual benefit with vitrectomy. Pure effects of vitrectomy not accessible. Tractional cases benefit more. And nobody supported ILM peel or removal of exudates. And refractory non-tractional macular edema needs to be defined scientifically if we have to avoid unnecessary vitrectomies. Now, any questions, you can give it to me in writing, right? Now, this so-called proliferative diabetic retinopathy can present as vitreous hemorrhage, dense, vitre dense hemorrhage, subhyaloid hemorrhage, NVD, NVE, TRD, TRD in regressed diabetic retinopathy and also a combined retinal detachment. Now, if you look at all these pictures, it is the status of the vitreous which governs the outcome and not the new vessels. To give you a case example, right eye of this patient got a PVD in the early part of the disease. The clean macula has been maintained for several years without any additional treatment, while the left eye of same patient presents as a huge subhyaloid bleeding. The point I want to convey, it is not the development of NV alone. All complications are dependent on the vitreous. 
and unfortunately this information was available at the time of DRS and ETDRS but they did not address the vitreous pathology. They advised blanket pan retinal photocoagulation to all proliferative diabetic retinopathy as the treatment. If they had addressed vitreous at that time, perhaps we would not be requiring to do vitrectomy now. Now my question, uh, this is a very demonstrative case. Left eye of this patient with such huge NVD, since I noticed PVD during the course of treatment, I have not done any further photocoagulation and this is maintained almost for last two and a half years. And right eye of the same patient is showing bleeding because no PVD took place. Now ETDRS has started with argon blue, green, krypton red and now we use green and diode red sometimes. My question to Professor Tewari is since he has played with all these wavelengths, that does it make a difference to the final effect? No, ideally speaking, ultimate result is the same. Whether you do blue, green, uh, krypton red or uh, other green, only thing is that uh, the collateral damages may be a little less. Histopathologically, people have proven. But if you see the vision wise, like after all, what is our aim? Our aim first is in diabetic patient is to maintain vision where it is and in some patients it may improve. So all of them do it. Yes, krypton, one advantage is there that in a hazy media, that the patient is having a mild bleed and all that, you can use it very safely. Will while where you, however you cannot use blue green or keep my close to you. However, you cannot use it uh, blue green to green. That that. So Krypton red is, a, is in hazy media is better. Your preferred wavelength today. Uh, uh, green. Green, yes. Sir. Now, ETDRS described 500 micron burn with a Goldman lens which appears very dangerous to me. Lalit, what is your lens choice and spot size? Lens should be such that which, which gives you a panoramic view. So trans equator lens is the preferred, my preferred lens and generally I do it with 200 microns. There are two modes of delivery and I have seen some people using laser indirect ophthalmoscope for macular photocoagulation. Shobit, will you ever do that? I have never done it, will never advocate it. In fact, I would say, go to the extent saying that even a PRP is more precise with a slit lamp delivery system. So, message is that LIO is not a very precise tool. This is a picture from ETDRS. Does anybody give this, this, this kind of confluent burns now? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I would not prefer giving that kind of confluent burns. Uh, we do little milder I use little minor burns than that what was used before and described by ETDRS. Right. Now coming to a very important thing, ETDRS said that 1200 to 1600 burns of this size is complete PRP. Lalit, you use a burn size of 200 microns. Yes sir. And when do you call with this size of burn that your PRP is complete after how many burns? I generally give uh, PRP in three sittings and on average put around uh, 7 to 800 spots per sitting. So that means around 2,500 spots is your complete. On an average, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now my another question to Professor Tiwari is that NVE should be directly photocoagulated, which I never believed in and I never did it and I never succeeded in closing a vessel on table. And my objection was that NVD indicates more severe retinal ischemia when this can disappear with an indirect PC. Why should we insist on directly hitting a vessel with such strong energy? You see, as we are today, we do not uh, directly treat the NVE. We do a PRP and forget about it. However, in past, I have been treating these NVEs directly. But did you have a bad experience sometimes? Yes, when no, it's not a question of a generalized bad experience. Yes, they do have a tendency to bleed. If you hit these vessels directly, they do have a tendency to bleed and sometimes it may precipitate a vitreous hemorrhage. But do you agree that NV will disappear with indirect yes. photocoagulation also? Yes, they do disappear. Now that, to be very frank with you, things have so changed. So what message I gave, indirect photocoagulation or direct photocoagulation? Indirect photocoagulation, right. that's fair enough. Now Lalit said that uh, up to 2,500 burns will complete his PRP, which can be extended to 3,000 burns as gathered information from others. Now ETDR has said that the signs of regression of retinopathy are involution of new vessels, venous narrowing, disappearance of hard exudates and hemorrhages and pallor of the disc. That means in every case they produce a consecutive optic atrophy. 
This is to show you another case example of ETDRS pattern pen retinal photocoagulation. And this is to show you another example and also to convey that burning fovea does not make new vessels disappear. Now, this concept evolved when the status of vitreous could not be studied with the help of OCT and B scan. And we did not have intravitreal anti of drugs to reduce the aggression of new vessels. We all know that posterior vitreous detachment can occur spontaneously during the course of disease. It can be induced by anti vegf and steroids and it could be laser induced also. And there are attempts at therapeutic vitreolysis as a treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Let me show you a case follow-up wherein we have used OCT as a tool to titrate PRP. This is a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. OCT at presentation does not show any PVD. At two weeks after we did some photocoagulation, PVD started occurring. This is picture at third week when there was complete separation of vitreous from the retina, so I stopped here. And sequential OCTs were done and at 12 weeks this was the picture with total PVD and normal macula. And this is angiography at the end of 12 weeks just with application of 900 burns of 200 micron size. I give you another case example, huge NVD, pre-retinal bleed, patient was given anti up, put on bed rest, picture at 48 hours and we did some laser and we found that this was the OCT and we did angiography and we found that at 8 weeks with around 1000 burns, that is an extended grid, all NVD had disappeared. Now this is very interesting, right and left eye of the same patient showing almost equal amount of neovascularization. The vitreous in right eye does not separate, the vitreous in left eye separated and at the end of 12 weeks, left eye shows complete regression of new vessels with similar amount of photocoagulation as done in right eye while vessels persist in right eye. My question to Professor Tiwari is, since you have traced the evolution of diabetic retinopathy and its treatment modalities from ancient times because now you are an ancient person. Will, no, you recommend, <laughs> will you recommend OCT and B scanned monitored PVD as a parameter to titrate the dose of PRP? Uh, look, one thing is there, uh, Arvind, uh, Dr. Arvind Dubey puts his facts uh, very straight. Let me be very honest with you. After doing OCT once, we do not do an OCT up to three months. Because he is doing a lot of charity work, he's a rich man. He does it in 24, 48 and hours hour, hour and one week. Ideally speaking, <coughs> what he has said is right. If you can precipitate a PVD, which can be done by you doing PRP, which can be done by giving ng which can even be done by giving just gas injection into the eye, then no further deterioration of diabetic retinopathy with special reference to the bleed will ever take place. This has been proven and it is it was taught to us that if there is a total PVD in a patient or proliferated diabetic retinopathy, rest assured it will involute on its own and there is no need to treat it. And I think you have scientifically very well substantiated it. Lalit, do you agree with what I have presented? Yes. yes. It's a very compelling evidence actually. You see, that is the reason I am now thinking, I was talking to Alok, that a lot of these patients who are myopes and coincidental diabetics also, a lot of these myopes have PVD. They do not show very aggressive kind of... Uh, yes. Beg your pardon? Yeah, plasmin. Yeah, yeah. All right, that is that is, that is come that that correct. that we are coming to. We that are coming being, to that. That is being used. Now my next question to Dr. Shobit is that as I showed that when you have PVD, you can leave new vessels. Is it necessary to obtain complete regression of new vessels, or is it possible to obtain complete regression of new vessels? No, it is not necessary, and it is not possible also. And what new vessels disappear with time are also part of the natural course of the disease. Right. Not necessarily. Now, of, uh, another okay. thing which is a very interesting observation which I will show, but I will pull view from Professor Tiwari that normally when you have a vitreous hemorrhage in a case of PDR, we say that it is new vessels that have bled. Is it true all the time? True, majority of time, but not all the time. Parent vessels can also bleed. Yeah, 100%. They, they do bleed. So that is to substantiate what I said in the beginning that it is the vitreous change which is more important, not the new vessels. Let me establish it through a case example. Type 1 diabetes mellitus, one year post PRP, absolutely quiet retina. Patient presented with this kind of bleeding. We did an angiography and found new vessels elsewhere and areas of capillary drop. We applied photocoagulation accordingly. 
now hemorrhage disappeared we did angiography at 2 months there were no new vessels now 4 months later patient again presented with this kind of bleeding but we were confident that the kind of photocoagulation we had done in 4 months he cannot develop such aggressive new vessels to explain this kind of bleeding we therefore kept this patient on bed rest and at 20 days the blood cleared so we were having the access to do angiography and we found that no new vessels were found on angiography only this area that is this parent vessel was bleeding and this was substantiated by the fact that over the same area there was a partial attachment of vitreous so what i want to convey that in an adequately lasered case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy if you are confident that you had done a good laser new vessels do not develop out of a sudden even the parent vessels can bleed and thus you can avoid doing aggressive unnecessary photocoagulation now comment from you call a need here yaar all right all right now shobit does pascal offer any advantage no it definitely does not and uh, it is not that precise it the advantage it offers is a one sitting affair for the patient less of pain but then i don't think everybody needs to drive a ferrari in our country all right so we summarize that complications of pdr are due to changes in the vitreous assessment of status of vitreous with b scan or oct can be a help milder prp than recommended by drs and ettrs is sufficient all bleeding is not always from new vessels direct laser on nve is not necessary and pascal has only relative merit now we come to part 3 that is surgery for proliferative diabetic retinopathy all these changes are caused by vitreous and these are indications for surgery let me show a case right and left eye of proliferative diabetic retinopathy in right eye recurrent bleeding takes place over this area patient maintains a vision of 6 by 9 i will be inclined to do a vitrectomy lalit in this case because i would find this vitrectomy as simple or easy as for a macular hole surgery will you interfere that early or you will wait i will have a dialogue with the patient because the aim of surgery is to this surgery is very simple at this stage Uh, that you just have to induce the PVD. Don't have to do anything else. But if vision is around six nine six by six, I'll have to have a detailed dialogue with the patient. All right. Will you, in general, recommend an early surgery today? And what will be your guidelines for early surgery? Early surgery. Uh, actually, surgery has you know now the classic teaching when Dr. Tiwari used to teach us wait for three to six months. Now, frankly speaking, a vitreous hemorrhage or even a fibrosis proliferation. which we intervene very early say within 2 weeks or so Do and laser hyaluronic uh, a laser hyaluronic laser hyaluronic only thing which does is to convert a sub uh, uh, ilm bleed into a into a, a vitreous hemorrhage basically and it can also induce a macular hole as i have shown here laser hyaluronic i did in this case and i produced a macular hole now i was a very good student i must tell you i was a meritorious student and i studied my anatomy very very thoroughly i could never explain to myself any anatomical arrangement to contain blood between retina and vitreous in this defined form like a boat or like a circle but they still call it subhyaloid bleeding there is no reason that blood should stay subhyaloid it must flow all over the retina and therefore when i grew up and uh, despite curses from professor tiwari i started operating on these cases i found that this was sub ilm blood this is the pre operative oct and these are tags of the ilm after i removed i want to know from shobit because he was a better student than me is there any anatomical arrangement between retina and vitreous to keep the blood sub hyaloid in such well defined form no sir i was not a better student than you but only thing which i learned from my surgical experience that it is not possible to remove this blood without removing the ilm so i assume it is always sub ilm it is sub sub ilm you i'll 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 like to make a comment here uh, if you go into the embryology of the retina then we all know that there is a potential space which is called sub hyaloid space if there is a potential space which is not compartmentalized i see no reason why the blood should remain in one that's right yes that's that's the advantage of uh, brilliant sir man gaye man gaye sir guru man gaye 
Now we, Ajit, I'll come. I'll come to that. Now this is to give you a clinical picture wherein even clinically you can see folds in the ILM here, while classically you will call it a subhyloid blood. Okay. Now another indication is traction retinal detachment and they say that extra macular TRD will progress in 15% cases annually to macula. And then there is very poor visual outcome once the macula is off. How early you would like to interfere with an extra macular TRD depending on location and duration? Lalit. If the, if, uh, I think earliest possible we should operate because earlier the surgery done, surgery is simpler, visual results are long lasting. If it is an inferior TRD far away from the macula, wait, wait, wait. you would like to. You see, wait. there are a lot of patients who will have extensive fibrous proliferation, but macula is spared in the center. And this patient may have 6 9 vision, maybe one eye, I am falling for 6 years, may not interfere. Shobit, uh, my recurrence rate, that is, rate for resurgery is less than 10 percent, and literature says 20 to 47 percent. What is your recurrence and resurgery rate? Recurrence of uh, bleeds or recurrence of? Recurrence of TRD and making you do a resurgery. I think it's much less now. It's much less. 10 to 12 percent. Now, which... this is another important debate. I asked with the uh, stalwarts, Professor Tiwari and others, that uh, when I give an anti up after how many days I can operate. So he said 10 days, somebody said 7 days, somebody said 15 days. So then I conducted that study wherein I did. Uh, daily angiograms to establish that when is the maximum effect of avastin and that should be the opportune time to operate on such cases. But I want to respect my faculty's view. Dr. Lalit, what time gap you allow between anti of injection and surgery? One to three days, sir. Alok? Usually we do it in three to four days. Time. Three to four days. Sir? What Lalit says, I can't refuse. Uh, day one, the injection, day three, the surgery. All right. So the consensus is that it is between 48 to 72 hours that you can operate and that's what I demonstrated in those serial angiograms that the peak effect is at 48 hours. Now there is a fear, Lilit, that they say that if you inject anti vegf in a case of traction retinal detachment, there can be a progression, worsening or even new onset TRD. What is your experience? I had the misfortune of facing a young lady, but the cavity is that it, it happens late. It happens late. If you leave this patient, patient who is candidate for surgery, inject anti vegf and somehow this patient because of kidney problem or some other patient does not come. So after a couple of months, say three months or so, it may precipitate a TRD. All right. So that is to substantiate what faculty stated. This is status before avastin. This is a status at 48 hours. There is complete effect of avastin. So you can safely operate after two days. Preference for 20, 23, 25, 27, all faculty. Dr. Lalit? As of now, 23 gauge. Alok? Is a 23 gauge. Sir? Lalit says 23, 23. Exclusively 25 gauge for diabetic effect. It's very good. It's very good. It's very good. It's very good. Show it. 25 gauge exclusively because I feel the use of ancillary instruments is decreased when you have a, a finer cutter and you're able to do most of the work with the cutter. Okay. Lalit, there can be lot many vitreo macular interface pathology related or unrelated to diabetic retinopathy in diabetic patients. Like a post laser ERM which can occur otherwise too, a macular hole, ERM. Right? Do you think that the pathology and the outcome after treatment is different in these cases? Dr. Lalit. I try to remove all ERMs, but ILM I don't insist in diabetics. But do you think outcome in diabetics, a diabetic has an idiopathic ERM is and worse. a non-diabetic is, is, worse. is worse. worse. Do you also look at it differentially, Alok? Yes, sir. It's uh, what I usually find it is difficult to peel the ERM. It comes out piecemeal and it's, the, the results are also not very predictable. The as possible reasons are that they are pre-lasered and there is an element of greater fibrosis. Shobit, do you always do a double peel while removing ERM? Do you always remove ILM also? We are only talking about diabetics here. And so, no, I don't do a double peel in a diabetic. All right. 
so we Not summarize necessary. that surgical urge surgical interference judged on case basis vitreous changes can progress despite regress retinopathy laser halidotomy is not recommended by dr lalit and when he does not recommend it professor tiwari does not recommend it so i also don't recommend no, it no he started it he said he started then we gave it up <laughs> all right so you all have to first start it and then give it up <laughs> now pre operative anti vegf are great help surgery can be done 48 hours after the injection anti vegf induced trd or ischemia is a theoretical fear surgery for vitreo macular attraction macular hole erm may not give outstanding results in diabetic patients and small gauge vitrectomy is welcome the future that i look to is vitreous separation and liquefaction by pharmacological vitreolysis as the primary treatment for diabetic retinopathy before retinopathy has set in because that will do away practically with everything they have tried plasmin tpcd rgd peptide streptokinase urokinase microplasmic injection pre surgically for easy surgical vitreous removement but since we do not correctly understand the vitreo retinal interface at molecular and sub molecular level today we do not know the correct resistance structure of vitreous collagen we do not know methods to modify hyaluronate if a study is conducted on primary vitreous changes a biochemical way then perhaps we may have some drug which will on day one separate vitreous and retina in all diabetics so lasers will go away anti vegf will go away vitrectomy machines will go away and professor tiwari and lalit will perhaps take on to fake or some other profession thank you so much and uh, i welcome questions from the audience please put on the lights